I want to welcome you all to City Hall today. Um, if I haven't met you, I'm Luchana Spraker. I'm the director of the City's Research Library Municipal Archives. And many of you are new faces today. We started the Hungry for History um, series for city employees, but we have now opened it up to, to the public, and so we're really excited about that. Um, before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to mention a couple of announcements. And there are um, items on the table, so if you want to grab um, a flyer before you walk out, um, uh, please do so. Um, we have received um, some flyers for free admission to uh, Georgia Southern University's um, The World's War is Georgia's War exhibit um, to hand out whenever we do World War I programming. So today we are doing a World War I program. So if you're interested in going up to Georgia Southern University's museum, this is a great exhibit. And it's going to be on display through January 28th, so you've got plenty of time to go to it. Um, this flyer will give you free admission for one person. So if you've got multiple people that you want to go, feel free to, to take um, multiple flyers. Um, it really explores George's role in World War I. So um, go up and see that exhibit. Um, for August, we're not going to do a Hungry for History program because we are going to be participating in a local um, multi-site um, program called Lift Every Voice. On Sunday, August 20th, from 12 to 4, multiple sites around Savannah are go going to be participating um, in an event to celebrate the opening of the Smithsonian, Smithsonian's African American History Museum in Washington, D.C. And the City Library and Archive is participating or partnering with the Beach Institute um, Museum over off of Price Street. We have an exhibit called Law and Music, um, exploring music or discovering music for, through the WW Law Collection. And the exhibit's going to be open for free. And the Library and Archive staff is going to be over there with all sorts of materials from our collection that will help you learn more about what we have to discover Savannah's African American history. So if you're interested in learning more about that, come on over. You'll get the opportunity to talk to the archivists and look at materials and touch them and explore them. And that's from 12 to 4 on Saturday, August 20th. The flyer has a listing of all the sites that are participating, and they are all open for free that day. Um, and the third thing I wanted to mention, we have our postcard about our small treasures exhibit, which is here at City Hall through the end of the year. It's in the council chamber. And if you haven't seen it, Megan, raise your hand. Um, we'll take you over there after this program if you want to go and see the exhibit. Um, we partnered with um, seven other cultural heritage um, partners in Savannah institutions who loaned us small treasures from their um, collections that represent Savannah's unique history. So it's a small, special little exhibit here at City Hall through the end of the year. So. Um, those are all my announcements for the day, but now we're going to get to our program for today. And I'm really excited that Lisa Vaughn um, agreed to come and um, present to you the German Hun in the Georgia Sun, Enemy Aliens in World War I Georgia. So Lisa completed her bachelor's degree in history from Middle Georgia State University and then went on to a master's in history with a graduate certificate in public history from Georgia Southern University. While at Georgia Southern, Lisa completed an internship with the Georgia Historical Society and helped develop in-school programming for the annual Georgia History Festival. Her thesis, The German Hun in the Georgia Sun, German Prisoners in, World, in War in, uh, blah, blah, German Prisoners of War in Georgia, offered a comparative analysis of the prisoner of war programs of World War I and World War II in the state. Um, and I'm sort of, I'm very interested in that. But she's going to focus on World War I today for us, since we are in the middle of the centennial of World War I, um, which the, the, we entered, the U.S. entered in 1917. So, so I'm going to turn it over to Lisa and um, let her get started. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, German enemy aliens in Georgia during World War I. Um, we're going to kind of get into what exactly classified an enemy alien a little bit later, uh, but these were German subjects. These weren't nat naturalized citizens of German descent that lived in the United States and faced some persecution during World War I, um, particularly in the state of Georgia. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. 
So I want to start off by just providing a little background. Uh, by the turn of the 20th century, the world had become increasingly globalized. There were people that were moving from their home countries to other countries and taking up permanent residence there. And they weren't always necessarily becoming citizens. So when war does break out in 1914 in Europe, uh, the French and the British especially are faced with these large German populations in their countries that they have to deal with. Um, and they have a lot of fear of what these German populations could mean. Because they've lived in France or Great Britain so long, do they more have loyalty to the, where they live currently or where their ho where homeland is? Um, so I just want to share with you some propaganda that is prevalent throughout Europe, uh, 1914, 1915, 1916, during which time America is in Europe. Because we were neutral until the American entry in the war in 1917, America did act as a protecting power, which means that we were over there. We helped uh, provide aid to enemy aliens that were interned in Great Britain and in France, and to prisoners of war. Uh, so while, we're over, while Americans are over there, uh, they're learning. They're learning what kind of problems society faced with these large populations, and they're learning how to kind of confront that problem if in the event they do become involved in the war. So this is one, um, just kind of shows you that people weren't very trusting of the Germans after that declaration of war. And then this is another one that does show the internment of enemy aliens in Britain. Uh, the fact that most people did believe that German subjects should be interned is something that we'll see that occurs in America too after 1917. Um, so, 1910 census does tell us that German was the second most spoken language in the United States. There was a very, very large German population. It was the largest ethnic group within American society. Um, so with America's role as a protecting power, they were seeing how the British and the French as a whole were dealing with having these potential enemies within their midst. And they knew that if they ever became involved, this would be a problem they would have to confront as well. Now, unsavory practice, German practices, such as the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915, uh, reported atrocities, especially in Belgium, that occurred during the war. And unrestricted submarine warfare did create some strong anti-German sentiment, even before the entry of America into the war within America. Prior to... 1917, though, we do see that Germans were regarded as very patriotic people, American, patriotic for the American, uh, for America, rather. Um, they were considered very hardworking, even though they did live within their own ethnic communities throughout the country. Uh, Germans tended to educate their children in German. They read German language newspapers almost exclusively. They were a very tight-knit and kind of slightly closed off, at least to those outside the communities. Uh, but they, that was not a problem, even after 1914 and with the war in Europe. By the time that 1917 does roll around, though, that perception had changed in America. And how we decided to move forward uh, does reflect that. By 1917, Americans did tend to view anyone really of German descent, but especially those who were still subjects of Germany, as being loyal to the Kaiser, not to America, um, and being very sympathetic to the German cause. And this did lead to an attack on German culture throughout the United States. It is at this time that we see Germans stop being offered in schools, which leads to uh, the unemployment of many German school teachers. German language newspapers were really not allowed to publish anymore, and those that did continue to publish did, see, did um, have some retribution. Um, we also see this pervasive fear of sabotage that pervades American society. Now, I do want to point out that this is not an unwarranted fear totally. Uh, there were some instances of German sabotage in 1916, there was a munitions factory in New Jersey that was 
blown up. And this was traced to Germans who were trying to prevent the Americans from selling armaments to the British and the French. There were other small instances of re reported attempts to meddle with American armament facilities or attempts at espionage, most of which could not be proven. We do have some of those even in Georgia that were tied back to Georgia with a very famous case of a woman who was from Georgia, had lived in Georgia her whole life, moved to New York City and fell in love with a German subject, got married, and he was implicated in an espionage plot in 1917. Her name, not his, exclusively, but hers as well, was plastered all over Georgia newspapers. Her picture all over Georgia newspapers is being implicated with a German spy. So these are things that are being reported in the newspapers, especially throughout Georgia. I do have a couple examples I want to show you just to kind of illustrate what was the prevalent perception of Germans throughout, the, throughout Georgia. So this one is a joke that appeared in a magazine from Atlanta in which German enemy aliens are being compared to the serpent in the Garden of Evil. This, they were seen as a lurking threat, a snake in the grass, something that we couldn't let go without some kind of action. This one, um, it's a little silly, but it does show the, the fear that Americans did feel. This is from Dalton, Georgia, uh, in which there's a, there was a very large reservoir in the city of Dalton. And one night, there was this loud noise, and everyone rushed out. There were people you know, calling the, the army, calling the local authorities. They were convinced that a German Zeppelin had tried to attack Dalton, Georgia. And what it ended up being was simply that the reservoir had overflowed and caused a bit of a mess. When they tried to report it, the uh, people working at the reservoir tried to report it, some kind of misunderstanding occurred, and the army was brought out. Citizens were coming out with pistols to, to fight the German Hun that was attacking Dalton, Georgia. Um, but these, these were real fears. This wasn't, I mean, it seems silly now, but people were really very scared that these, that Germans within the country were going to do them harm. And then this is another one that, this is uh, from a paper in Athens, that these were, these were common, that this is a way that they were actually trying to shut German American, well, German citizens, and in, to some extent German Americans, out of public life. I mean, this is, you know, we're going we're gonna to reveal the truth about the Kaiser. You might not want to be involved. You might not want to know. Uh, but the deeper message here is, is that you're not wanted. Keep away from normal society. At this time, um, as far as German culture in the United States, we're also seeing some changes in what we call things that have vaguely German-sounding names. Uh, hamburgers for the war, war period were referred to as liberty steaks. Uh, sauerkraut was liberty cabbage. And frankfurters became what we all know them as today, hot dogs. This is when this, this change really happens because you didn't want anything associated with German culture in America. Now some of this does take more of a, a sinister route. Uh, there were people within the country who believed that every American citizen should be a vigilante when it came to dealing with Germans within their borders. Uh, there were instances of violence, um, including several tar and featherings of German enemy aliens throughout the country. There were, and granted there were few, but there were examples of uh, firebombings of German churches throughout the country because they were convinced that this was our enemy. These were not Americans, they were the enemy. After this initial kind of thrust of persecution, Germans realized that this was not, this was not going to just blow over. So there was a, a sense of forced assimilation for those who did not want to be associated with the Kaiser and what was going on in Europe. 
they had to make some changes. These changes did include the, the anglicizing of German names. People changed their surnames to sound more English, to sound more American, so that they would not automatically be associated with the, German, with the Germans. Um, there were also public displays of patriotism that these that German communities would put on. Those who were determined to separate themselves from German culture and to solidify their position as an American or someone who was loyal to America. Uh, these public displays would include um, kissing of the flags, of the American flag and big parades. Um, anything they could do to show that America was where their priority was, it's where their loyalty was, it wasn't to Germany. wrong button. Um, all this fear does culminate in the internment of German enemy aliens in the United States during the war period. I know I've kind of used this term enemy aliens. I do want to take a moment to describe exactly what that is. This is an enemy alien was someone who was not naturalized. They, they could have lived here their whole lives but they had not actually become a citizen yet. Um, they were of German descent in this case, but this also could apply to any other belligerent nations in World War I, so Austro, uh, the Austro-Hungarians would technically be enemy aliens as well. Um, these were people that faced all of this persecution first before the war even starts with their connection with Germany. But with the April 6, 1917 declaration of war, things changed drastically. With the declaration of war, enemy aliens came under attack as well with Woodrow Wilson's proclamation 1364, which does call for the handling of these enemy alien populations. And I do want to just briefly read that to you. All natives, citizens, denizens, or subjects of a hostile nation or government, being males of the age of 14 years and upwards, who shall be within the United States and not actually naturalized, shall be liable to be apprehended, restrained, secured, and removed as enemy aliens. Article 12 of this proclamation does stipulate what those situations for arrest were. And essentially, I'm not going to read the, the legalese to you, but essentially what it boils down to is if you were suspected of anything untoward or if anyone suspected you of being loyal to the Kaiser. That's it. Suspicion. This is a photograph of so many enemy aliens that were transported to Fort Oglethorpe, which is here in Georgia, North Georgia, um, right outside of Chattanooga, which is where we will be kind of talking about next. Um, as far as the amount of enemy aliens, I know we've talked about how they were the second largest ethnic group, but at the declaration of war, there were four million 662,000 enemy aliens throughout the U.S. There was no way that the United States government was equipped to have any kind of program in place to handle that many people that were facing this persecution. Now, of that number, 964,000 of them were males over the age of 21, and 2,349,000 were German. Slightly less than that, you have about 1.3 million Austro-Hungarians. Now, we've talked about how Austro-Hungarians could also be classified as an enemy alien. They were subjects of a hostile nation. But, despite that, them falling into that definition, Woodrow Wilson does, in 1917, make a statement in which he says that the Austro-Hungarians had already proved their loyalty to America. 
that they had put in their strong work and that they should not fo face the same restrictions as Germany, as Germans. Uh, this really does illustrate that this was an ideological war against Germany. It wasn't about the war as a whole, it was about Germans and what they represented. Now those restrictions do begin right after the April 6, 1917 proclamation. Um, they would include German-born males from owning guns, radios, explosives, seems rational, seems logical. Um, however, it did also prevent them from living or even being within a half mile of any government facility. An armament, a radio station, even fairgrounds where troops were housed. Anyone found within that half mile radius would be subject to arrest. Those who lived within a half mile radius had to move. The government did as best they could assist in finding them new living quarters, but these were people who had to abandon their homes and businesses because of the location. Even if something later propped up that wasn't there before, if it had any connection to the government or the military, they could no longer own it. Um, in rare cases, they would be offered a special permit that they could apply for. These permits had to be signed by well-known citizens in order to vouch for this enemy alien, and they also had to place a bond on it. And the bond was of indeterminate amount. So whatever official you gave your application to decided how much they were going to charge you to apply for this permit. After November of 1917, and male enemy aliens also had to register at local post offices and carry registration cards. If you were found without your registration card, you were subject to immediate arrest. I think it is important to, to point out the distinction in that arrest did not mean you were automatically interned at, a, at Fort Oglethorpe. Uh, you could be arrested, held for a short period of time in holding facilities, and released on parole until some, in, unless something else happened. A lot of times people were arrested, they were never interned, but were released on parole to help the government find other enemy aliens to arrest. Uh, so we, we see a lot of that. Um, in April of 1918, these restrictions do apply to women, where all women enemy aliens had to register as well. Something that is interesting is that at this time period, when women got married, they took on the citizenship of their husbands. So even if an American-born woman, she's a citizen of the United States, if she marries a German subject, she becomes German and has to register. The woman that I spoke of earlier from Georgia was one of the things that is talked about in the newspaper articles. And when she does file for divorce in 1919 from her German husband, uh, she talks about how that was something that, that hurt her self-esteem, it hurt her standing in the community, that her life was never going to be the same because of having to be registered as an enemy alien. Her name would forever be on those rolls. So in March 1918, Fort Oglethorpe became a facility exclusively for German enemy aliens. Prior to that, a small number of German prisoners of war had also be held, been held there, uh, but after March 1918, they were transferred to Fort McPherson in Atlanta, and this was a camp exclusively for enemy aliens. Uh, this camp was mostly, was mostly populated by German intellectual elites. These were people that were considered too dangerous, too influential, too popular to be allowed to remain free. The government feared they would be rallying points for other enemy aliens who, whose loyalties maybe did side with Germany. They were, they were too dangerous to allow to remain free. Ultimately, 2,300 enemy aliens were interned at Fort Orgothorpe. Um, 
fort was, the camp was divided into three separate camps. So we had Camp A, which is the camp that housed all the internees that could afford to pay for themselves. These prisoners could hire other, other enemy aliens in turn from other camps to act as cooks and stewards and, and things as that. Uh, these, this is really the biggest camp and where these intellectual elites were housed. Um, one notable intellectual elite that was held here was Karl Muck. He was the, or, the conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He was arrested and interned for allegedly refusing to play the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, this was widely believed to have not been true. Um, the public opinion, to an extent, even believed that he had not refused to play this, the, the Star Spangled Banner, but this was something that falls into that. You were suspected of not being loyal. You could be arrested. Uh, even though people didn't admit that it probably wasn't true, he still was interned at Fort Oglethorpe until 1920. The facilities in Camp A uh, provided partitioned areas for privacy. You had separate washrooms, um, a little bit more room to move. Uh, when you go to Camp B, it's not nearly as luxurious. Uh, this is where the, the average man, enemy alien, would have been housed. Uh, these were 13 100-man barracks that were erected throughout the camp. They did not have partitions. However, the men who did live in Camp B were offered the opportunity to work. Now, the prevailing treaty of the time, the Hague Convention, does state that you cannot force an enemy alien to labor for anything other than their own life. So whatever to keep them alive and healthy, that's the only thing you could force them to do. But the men in Camp B were offered the opportunity to work, but it had to be voluntary. The Americans did stand by this. In fact, they did require all men who did volunteer to work to sign several papers stating, I am volunteering to do this. So there was, there was documentation that this was not forced labor. At Fort Oglethorpe in November of 1918, the Adjunct General's office gave permission for 100 intern enemy aliens to work with the Quartermaster's Corps in Camp Forest, Georgia. So these men were moving about Georgia, providing labor in this drained economy with all these men signing up. Uh, the Adjutant General did also state that enemy aliens had to be per pay the prevailing rate that was in uh, work camps and in POW camps, which in November of 1918 was $1.25 a day. They could use this money to buy extra food and supplies at the camp canteen, uh, but mostly the value in this work for the prisoners was that it filled their days. These people are, in, are interned in, in this camp. They can't force them to work. They really have nothing for them to do. So a lot of men did volunteer um, to have something to fill their days. Now, Camp A, these men really didn't have permission to work, and these were people who, they were artists. And so in a lot of ways, Camp A and Oglethorpe in general becomes something of an artist commune during this period. These are some examples of some art that was created at Fort Oglethorpe during 19, uh, 1917 to 19, 19, 1920. Um, these were all created by the same man, and they aren't really famous pieces of art. They're just little family uh, heirlooms that I was able to, to access online. Uh, but these were, were paintings of his surroundings. It's a, it's a pencil drawing of the barrack. Um, as you see the partitions, Camp A. And I think that this, this picture is, is very significant. Uh, the focus of this 
is the barbed wire that surrounds the camps. Due to America's involvement in the war prior to 1917 as a protecting power, they knew of research that was happening in the camps, these enemy alien intern camps in Europe. Uh, one psychologist had developed this theory of a mental condition that began to affect these men who were interned. Uh, symptoms included depression, lethargy, a general lack of, of will to do most anything. Um, this became known as barbed wire disease because one of the, the things that, that uh, Dr. Vischer did find that was significant to these men and really had a significant impact on their psyche was the actual barbed wire that surrounded the camp. What is particular to this as opposed to just they were depressed is that these men were taken out of their normal lives. This is not like a prison sentence in which you know how long you are going to serve. You're going to serve for an, you're going to be interned in these camps with little to do for an indefinite amount of time while life passes by outside the barbed wire. Because the Americans were aware of these, these risks, suicide being the worst case scenario for people who suffered from this, uh, they did try to provide for leisure activity, to try to keep the men outside of their heads, engaged in life, to try to, to stave off by wire disease. Uh, some of those activities in, at Fort Oglethorpe included uh, three orchestras. They had a theatrical group, a comedy production company, sports clubs, literary groups. They were allowed to publish a German language newspaper in the camp until 1919, heavily censored, of course. This magazine printed literary columns, music reviews, any form of news that the internees would find interesting to try to keep them engaged. The prisoners also created diversions of their own that were not provided to them. Uh, at, at Camp Oglethorpe, uh, they took to directing plays. Uh, the camp theater actually did become the amusement center of these camps. Theater companies, three of which were founded at Fort Oglethorpe, put on many different plays, a uh, couple of which being the, A Night at the Inn, The Glittering Gate, and Stein unter Stein, Steine. And those who were interned in Georgia were also allowed religious services. There were not ministers or chaplains posted at these forts, but traveling ministers did visit to, provide, to perform the services so that they would have the option to attend. Ultimately, why this is important is that it does provide a different wartime narrative than what we usually hear. The fear and hatred of the German population led to the internment of German men, oftentimes without proof of any wrongdoing. A lot of this can be drawn to what is known as total war. This war hysteria surrounds the concept of total war because it calls for all members of society to be equally involved in defeating the enemy. It blurs the lines between civilian and combatant. This ideology transforms what would be just a normal war into a clash of cultures. One must not defeat Germany just on the battlefield, but one must defeat German culture as a whole. And in a lot of ways, a lot of steps were taken during this war period to accomplish that in America. After 1917, forced assimilation had been completed. And Americans generally suggested that patriotic Americans could not be 
sympathetic to Germans at all. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> question. Sure. Um, during this time, was there um, a desecration or a destruction of German artifacts that might have been here? Did you, have, did you research show any of that, that? I didn't find any specific examples of it. Um, I would not be surprised. Uh, however, a lot of those that you would find would have been family heirlooms, which the general public who would have been interested in destroying them wouldn't have access to. So I think a lot of those were saved simply by virtue of them belonging to certain families. Well, and maybe you said and I missed it, but did they round up the Germans around the country and bring them to Georgia as like the Boston conductor, or were these Georgia residents that were put in the camp? So there are only actually two containment facilities in the entire United States that focus on enemy alien containment. One was in Fort Douglas, Utah, and the other was at Fort Oglethorpe. If you lived west of the Mississippi, you went to Utah. If you lived east of the Mississippi, you came to Georgia. Um, you mentioned that there were residents, or there were uh, enemy aliens at Fort Oglethorpe in 1919. Mm -hmm. So did the camp close after the Treaty of Versailles, or did it continue? The camp, the camp begins shutting down with the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Um, enemy alien, no, prisoners of war, uh, typically they did start the repatriation process, uh, slow though it, it could be, um, when hostilities ceased in World War I. There, there were so few prisoners of war in America that they kind of started that process early. Uh, enemy aliens had to wait until the signing of the Treaty of Versailles for that process even to begin. Um, and that included repatriation agreements because many enemy aliens were not allowed to stay. Twenty three hundred in Georgia, um, somewhere around I think forty five hundred. Um, I don't have that number written down, so don't quote me. Uh, throughout the United States. Okay. Um, the second one I had was about the Austro-Hungarian. Mm -hmm. um, do you? And I guess I had two questions there. You know, to, to an extent, much greater than the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian was multi-ethnic. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there was any distinction there in how the discrimination worked say a serbo croatian versus a Hungarian versus a Romanian or something, or a <coughs> actual German talking or an American to the most part get those distinctions <laughs> The Americans really didn't uh, make much distinction between the different ethnicities within the, the empire. Um, many believed them not to be enemy aliens at all. Uh, this is something that's actually reported in German newspapers where an Austro-Hungarian enemy alien was arrested in Augusta and most of the city was like, why? He's not an enemy alien. Uh, he was arrested and went to, went to trial to kind of try to decide how to deal with this, but many people didn't believe Austro-Hungarians to be enemy aliens at all. Uh, they said that they were morally and militarily at war with Germany. The last question I have, and I'll stop working here, <laughs> is just, um, you know, the, I'm thinking of the, the obvious, more well known case of Japanese internment in World War II, and you know, the justifiable claims for reparations and public apology that have been made there. To your knowledge, is, has there been any attempt over the years since World War I for descendants of German internees, I guess, for lack of a better term, to, to try to seek something similar? I have found no reports of that. Um, there really wasn't a lot of confiscated property in the way there, would, there was with the, with the Japanese in World War II. Um, they were forced to abandon businesses. They, I mean, they, could, they could keep the building, they just couldn't be in it. Um, yes, and, and, and in World War II we see that as to American citizens as opposed to people we considered other because they weren't citizens. I was going to ask just for comparative purposes, since you studied them, just mention a little bit about the World War II experience of the German internment camps in Georgia. Sure. 
Um, so in World War II, we don't see any internment of enemy aliens in Georgia. It is only prisoners of war, um, and there are, were a lot of German prisoners of war in Georgia in World War II. Um, there were branch camps uh, that were in Statesboro. They were here at Fort Stewart. They were in Fort Oglethorpe. They were at um, Fort Benning in Columbus. They had branch camps in, uh, in Macon, in various parts of Atlanta uh, that were providing service to those areas. Uh, they weren't able to labor on anything considered directly related to the war effort in World War II, uh, but they were there and they had to have something to do. So uh, in Statesboro and he in heavy agricultural areas, they, they farmed. They um, picked peanuts and did keep them from rotting in the fields because the labor pool was so draft drained in World War II. And in other areas, especially in North Georgia, they did a lot of forestry work. Uh, there, were, there was a lot, of, a lot of labor that those prisoners provided in the state of Georgia that wouldn't have gone undone if not for that labor supply. Um, we also see that a tiny bit in World War I with the prisoners of war in Atlanta. Uh, Fulton County sewer systems were rebuilt by prisoners of war in World War I. Uh, so there, there was a little bit, but it, the scale is just so different between the two wars. Uh, in World War I, we did not bring any prisoners from the continent. So the only prisoners of war that, that were in the United States, and they were in Georgia at Fort McPherson, all of them, uh, were merchant marines or any kind of sailor that had sought safe harbor in American docks before the war started. So if on April 6, 1917, your boat was in an American harbor, you were immediately, immediately imprisoned as a prisoner of war. Uh, well, to answer your question first about the marriage, uh, citizenship followed the husband. Um, so you would never, as a man, you would never lose your citizenship based on who you married, uh, but a woman did have to release her citizenship of a country to marry a man and took on his nationality. As far as the naturalization process, um, it, it was rigorous. There was still testing that occurred. Um, as far as the specifics of it, um, I unfortunately don't have a lot of detail on that. Um, it sounds like something that would be int really interesting to look into, uh, and especially with the dual citizenship. I have not run across anything that suggested it was a possibility. Um, it may have been for men, but it was absolutely not an option for women um, upon their marriage. Were there any children in the camp? No. And they, you weren't classified an enemy alien until the age of 14, which was something that we did borrow from Europe. Um, 14 was considered in Germany, was when you start have, you were conscripted at 14. Uh, so that was just carried over to all enemy alien programs in Europe and America. Um, there are not any cases that I found in which an enemy alien at the age of 14 was interned. I'm sure they were arrested and, and quickly released. Uh, just based on suspicion, uh, but I did not see, I did not found any evidence um, in Georgia or in Utah of someone that young being interned. Um, women were very seldom 
interned in the camps, uh, but usually they were quickly let go because they didn't have the facilities to create separate barracks. Um, and a lot of times women were allowed to visit their interned husbands, uh, but those were few and far between. Um, I'm not sure if you said this, but after um, uh, the war was over, you, you said that the, um, the German alien, uh, enemy aliens, they weren't allowed to stay anymore? Some were, some weren't. Um, there were plans that were talked about, about we're just going to send them all back, uh, but that didn't really work out. Uh, but a lot were repatriated back to Germany and were not allowed back access to the United States for the rest of their lives. So the general feeling after the war was still, uh, it was, the prejudice was still pretty extreme for a number of years. Yes, absolutely. Which is interesting because by the time we get to World War II a generation later, Americans had no different feeling towards Germans, even throughout the war years, because the Japanese were those villainized in the Second World War. Um, so the, the prejudice towards the Germans does persist for a couple of years, but that forced assimilation takes effect so quickly, there's really nothing to discriminate against by the time you get a couple of years outside the war. They did. It was okay again. Sauerkraut can be sauerkraut, but we kept hot dogs. <laughs> I do wonder, though, if some of that assimilation, when you, because I'm thinking from my own experience, I went to a public college, I was in the North this year, and I had some friends whose parents still went to German speaking Lutheran congregations in rural areas, kind of northern and central Michigan and Indiana, and I just sort of assumed that their ancestry must be more recent. Well, both of mine was. Turns out, in most cases, it was reversed. My German side had been here longer. So I always wondered what it was about certain pockets of, you know, in my case, my family from Ohio, you know, portions of the Midwestern states where you have people who would identify as Germans among themselves, but for all intents and purposes, we didn't have any particular German and friends of mine whose immigration was as recent or more so, who were very, you know, very proud of their German as a thing, even you know, as late as the 1990s, whether maybe the, the diverse responses to this internment might have had something to do with that. Uh, definitely, play, definitely will play a role into it. And mm -hmm. um, what we have to remember is what, I, what we've talked about today is very general. Um, you know, this is the case in the areas that we've talked about, but there are pockets of places that never go with what's going on with the rest of society. That just because in Augusta and in New York and in you know Fort Douglas, Utah, and in San Francisco, we're seeing this you know outrageous persecution of the German population doesn't mean that some little tiny town in Ohio was like, eh, it's no big deal. You know, we, we know these guys, they're our, they're our friends, they're, they've been in our community forever, we know who they are, so you don't see that, um, which had to be the case in some small areas where it takes the opposite and other small areas. Even though you did know these people, there was a cultural war on, and we aimed to win. Oh, I was just gonna ask one last question. Um, um, I'm kind of getting exposed to a lot of this, so I feel like there's a lot I don't know. Uh, um, and so it was a little hard for me to follow a little bit initially. Generally, your opinion would be, though, was that there was not really any substance to um, the Germans that were living in the United States at the time actually being a threat to America. It was kind of, like you said, just ideological. Like you said, there was like maybe one or two cases where that they had seen anything at all. So there definitely is, there, there are valid, you know, traceable cases of this happening. They were not the majority. They are isolated incidents. Um, a lot of you see with former German military who have come to the country, have never hidden their former German, pa German military past, and then people are surprised when their loyalty is to the German military. Um, it, isn't, it isn't your average citizen that is involved in these things. Um, it's people who have a strong military background who would assume would have their loyalties to the countries they fought for. Um, these are not surprising cases. These aren't, you know, the guy who ran your local grocer is, is breaking into the, the local armory and stealing reports and things like that. Um, they're very isolated. It, it just becomes us versus them. 
um, these, these cultural wars in which anything associated with, even vaguely associated with Germany, is, is anti-American. It, you have to, the German people who wanted to prove their loyalty had to be more American than Americans in order to, to not face this harsh persecution. Did I answer your question? I kind of want yeah. Okay. So, so, even, um, so if they had been born here in the um, you know, 1890s or something, that would not have had any, there would have been no problem at all because they were born here, they were citizens. Even though right. their parents had not. Right. So citizens didn't face the same threat of arrest or, or internment, but they did still feel those effects of persecution. Um, you know, with feeling compelled to have to change your family name so that people don't identify you as an enemy, things like that, they just, it wouldn't have been as dangerous for them um, to have faced, you know, some of the instances of violence and this potential arrest and this black mark on your record for the rest of your life that you've been interned. My, my, grand, my grandfather was, was born <laughs> in 1898 and he served in World War I. Oh. But, no jubilee, and that was a dead giveaway. Yeah. But I don't remember any stories of him. Um, was he from Savannah, or? He was born in Savannah. Born in Savannah. Yeah. Um, some people didn't didn't bow to the pressure, um, you know, and did still take pride in their names, and just found other ways, like serving in the United States military, to prove their loyalty. Um, others, you know, felt they had to go farther and farther and farther. To prove that to prove that loyalty and to prove that they were Americans um, and that they their loyalties did lie here. So experiences do differ. Um, the only thing that we do really kind of see that is in common is that there's this pressure to be not German. One more sure. I'm not sure if I misunderstood, but did you say there were three different sections in the camps A, B, and I didn't was there a C? There is, and I might have not talked about it. I'm so yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, so Camp C was it was very small. It's just for punishment. Um, anybody who got in trouble in the camp went to Camp C, was put on half rations, and was not allowed to work uh, to earn any kind of gain any kind of extra funds in order to purchase those extra foods. Um, it was very small. It wasn't often used. Um, it was it was just there. Camp A and B are really the focus of where the large populations were. Did the fellow that was the boss? Um, he, he did return to music. Um, I, I believe he did eventually return to the Boston Symphony Orchestra, um, but it was not immediate. Any other questions? Uh, I'm going to just mention two things that are kind of like local stories that play into things Lisa talked about. There were some articles in the local Savannah Morning newspaper about, and I don't know if he was a German, I mean a naturalized American citizen at this point, or if he was still a German enemy alien about being marched through the streets by a mob and being forced to repeatedly kiss the um, U.S. flag to prove that he was loyal and patriotic. So um, a local example here, unfortunately, about um, somebody who was being forced to, to show that he was loyal and patriotic. Um, also, I be believe, and um, I might have to follow up on this, that the Germania Bank had to be renamed just sort of, you know, following that, you know, we need to sort of, you know, white German off of our name for Liberty business Bank. purposes, yeah. Liberty Bank. Um, so, you know, you can see these examples right here in our local community um, of, but, but there are other examples of, you know, German Mutual Aid Society and things like that where we still retain our German heritage, but yet at the same time we are, you know, playing into the exact same things that um, were popping up in Lisa's research as well. So, I want to thank Lisa for um, coming out today. Um, and before you leave, if you do want to go see the Small Treasures exhibit, we invite you to do that. Um, take a free um, pass for admission to the Georgia Southern exhibit, and then join us to, for the Lift Every Voice event on August 20th. So let's give um, Lisa another <laughs>